Welcome once again to our study on the book of Proverbs. We've been studying the literary technique of short speeches used by the father to his son in the first nine chapters of Proverbs. In our last lesson, we looked at a unique poetical structure of speech two and briefly covered some interesting points in the three sections of speech three. My goal for this lesson is to cover briefly speeches four through seven. We have no time to waste, so let's get started. The fourth speech of the father to his son is found in chapter 4, verses 1 to 27. Briefly, this speech commends wisdom's virtues and blessings to the son. The father warns his son to choose the way of wisdom over the way of the wicked, while describing their opposite results. The father ends his speech by encouraging his son to follow wisdom with his whole body. There are a few new points in this speech that we will note as we examine each literary section. The fourth speech of the Father divides into three sections. Section 1 of speech 4 is verses 1 to 9. This consists of the Father's advice based upon what he has learned from his Father in verses 3 to 9. This section provides interesting insight into the household instruction of ancient Israel. The passage suggests instruction was done primarily by the Father to his young son, which in turn was passed on to the next generation. Such instruction may have been skills of a trade or business. Most likely, it also covered teaching on one's life, family, and community responsibilities. Wisdom tested by personal experience over generations of use was passed on to the next generation. It was practical in orientation and designed to provide all the life skills a son needed to succeed. Let me point out a couple of technical points in this first section. First. The plural mention of sons in chapter 4, verse 1, is only found here in Proverbs, though in some Bible versions the word children in later chapters is translated sons. This would include chapter 5, verse 7, chapter 7, verse 24, and chapter 8, verse 32. The plural term could easily reflect a father who had many sons, a blessing in Israelite families. Or it could suggest the speeches were designated for more formal classroom training where an older, wiser scholar of the community taught young men of wealthy families. Second, in the quotation from the grandfather, verses 4 to 9, wisdom is portrayed as a woman to be loved, verse 6, one who will exalt her lover when he embraces her, verse 8. Wisdom is spoken of in intimate relationship terms, such as a wife. This relational aspect will become even more significant as we study further in Proverbs. The second section of the Father's fourth speech is verses 10 to 19. This section outlines a contrast between the way or path of wisdom encourages, verse 11, and the way of the wicked, verse 14. A summary statement contrasting the two ways is found in verses 18 and 19. Let me add two points here. First, chapter 4, verse 10 begins with a my son marker, leading some to believe this starts a new speech. However, most scholars believe it is a continuation of the speech begun in verse 1. The flow of the speech confirms it is a continuation. Second, for the first time in Proverbs, light and darkness are used in the summary statement to describe the ways of wisdom and wickedness, respectively. Most Christians today are familiar with these terms because of John's Gospel in the New Testament. Section 3 of the Father's speech is verses 20 to 27. Here the father emphasizes that wisdom should be embraced by the son's whole body, including his ears, verse 20, eyes and heart, verse 21, mouth and lips, verse 24, and feet, in verse 26. This instruction reflects total commitment to wisdom. And with the emphasis on heart, the father underscores the importance that wisdom teaching must be internalized. This speech contradicts the often popular view that the Old Testament taught laws for external obedience, while the New Testament emphasizes internal obedience of the heart. There is plenty of evidence to show that God in the Old Testament 
sought obedience of the heart as well. Note the words of the Father to His Son in chapter 4, verse 23. Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Speech 5 of the Father is located in chapter 5, verses 1 to 23. Once again, the teaching returns to the now familiar theme of the adulteress. However, this time, the father underscores the dangers of the son spending his strength and wealth on the adulteress. The older, wiser father emphasizes the end-of-life regrets that come from such immoral behavior. The father encourages marital faithfulness as the true source of happiness in an interesting metaphor of a cistern or reservoir. In what I consider an extension of speech 5, I believe the Father adds four examples of wicked behavior to the summary statement on God's punishment of wickedness found in chapter 5, verses 21 to 23. These four examples spill over into chapter 6 and go all the way to chapter 6, verse 19. This means the sixth speech begins at verse 20. Let's examine the five sections of speech 5. Section 1 of speech 5 is found in verses 1 to 6. This section contains a short appeal for attention to the Father's words, verses 1 and 2, followed by a brief statement about the first topic, the adulteress. The Father warns His Son that though she appears sweet and tempting in words, mannerism, and dress, she is actually a bitter, deadly threat, verses 3 to 6. Let me add a couple of technical notes. First, the word adulteress in this section actually means stranger woman. She is not the son's intimate companion of covenant marriage, but a stranger in relationships. It could also mean a woman who has broken her marriage vows by being unfaithful to her husband. Second, the word honey, found in verse 3, does not mean sweet kisses, but rather the seductive and insincere speech of a harlot. Third, the phrase translated bitter as gall in verse 4 actually contains the Hebrew word for wormwood which is a plant-like shrub in Palestine with a very bitter taste. Wormwood appears again in Revelation chapter 8, verse 11, as the name of a star bringing much bitterness to the world during the third trumpet judgment. Fourth, the death mentioned by the Father in verse 5 is not just a spiritual death, but a physical one. Death was the law's command for an adulterer and the adulteress. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10 says, If a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress are to be put to death. Deuteronomy chapter 22 verse 22 says the same thing but adds the rationale for such a harsh action by saying, you must purge the evil from Israel. Section 2 of this speech is found in verses 7 to 14. This part contains an encouragement by the father to avoid the adulteress or face a bitter end with self-guilt. Here the voice of personal experience rings loud and clear. The older men who have seen this tragedy played out in the lives of others, or who have fallen into this trap themselves, speak from life experience. They realize too late their strength and hard-earned money was used to build up someone else's house, verses 9 and 10 and that all such labors only bring bitter regret and shame to the family in front of the whole community. The lament of verses 11 to 14 reflect the bitter agony of someone who has not listened to his father's counsel. Listen to the father's warning. At the end of your life, you will groan. When your flesh and body are spent, you will say, How I hated discipline! How my heart spurned correction! I would not obey my teachers or turn my ear to my instructors and I was soon in serious trouble with the assembly of God's people. This is a voice of experience giving a heartfelt warning to his son to avoid the very real dangers of unfaithfulness with the adulteress. Section 3, verses 15 to 20 of this speech by the Father describes one of the most unique metaphors found in the Bible for faithfulness within a marriage relationship. The young man's wife is described as a cistern a water tank, or more appropriately, a reservoir. The father encourages his son to drink from his own cistern, 
and not allow his own spring to overflow into the streets and public places. In other words, find your sexual pleasure at home and nowhere else. The father speaks a blessing on his son's marriage relationship. He says, May your fountain be blessed, and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. May her breasts satisfy you always. May you ever be intoxicated with her love. Verses 18 and 19. Faithfulness to one's wife is more strongly encouraged here than in any other speech by the father. Section 4 of speech 5 is found in verses 21 to 23. This part of the speech plays a dual role of a moral reminder for unfaithfulness, but expands the teaching to the larger arena of life in general. God examines all paths, and the sinner entangled in sin, because of his lack of discipline, will receive his just punishment. The broadening effect of God's oversight allows the father to branch out and add four additional subjects to his speech in section 5 that also produce regrets at the end of life, referred to in chapter 5, verses 11 to 14. Section 5 of speech 5 is found in chapter 6, verses 1 to 19. I believe this speech spills over into chapter 6 with more regrettable actions that the son must avoid. They include putting up financial security for a neighbor, verses 1 to 5, laziness, verses 6 to 11, the characteristics of a scoundrel, verses 12 to 15, and seven behaviors and attitudes the Lord hates, verses 16 to 19. Let me give a few technical points for this section. First, security, in verse 1, means one has agreed as a surety to pay the debt of a needy person. Israelites were forbidden to take interest from each other according to Exodus chapter 22, verse 24. Also, guidelines were given in Deuteronomy 24, verse 6, and verses 10 and 11, concerning putting up securities for others. Proverbs mentions the topic of putting up a security six times, most often in the negative. Second, the ant mentioned in verse 6 appears again in verse 25 of chapter 30, the only times in the Bible, as a small but industrious worker. The same summary Verses 10 and 11 of chapter 6 appears again in chapter 24, verses 33 to 34, as the conclusion of a story of a lazy man. Animals and their behavior form part of wisdom literature, and humans are expected to learn from them. Third, the sluggard of chapter 6, verse 6 appears again in chapter 26, verses 13 to 16, and in chapter 24, verses 30 to 34. Laziness in Proverbs is a characteristic of a fool, not a wise man, and they cannot escape the threat of poverty. Fourth, the villain, or scoundrel, of verse 12 literally means man of Belial. Belial is a demon in the Bible and in Jewish and Christian apocrypha. He is one of the four crowned princes of hell. He characterizes immense wickedness. For the wise men of Israel, body language used by this villain often reflects the inner person. Fifth, the numerical saying of chapter 6, verses 16 to 19, takes the members of the body used in verses 12 to 15 for describing the villain and teaches that their use in such an evil way is detestable to the Lord. Proverbs lists ten other things the Lord detests. They are found in chapter 3, verse 32 chapter 11, verse 20, chapter 12, verse 22, chapter 15, verses 8 and 9, and in verse 26, chapter 16, verse 5, chapter 17, verse 15, and chapter 20, verses 10 and 23. Before we move on to speech 6 in chapter 6, verses 20 to 35, it would be good to stop and examine chapter 6, verses 1 to 19 a little more. Should these verses be the conclusion of speech 5 or the clumsy beginning for speech 6? More interestingly, why are these unrelated topics interjected between two speeches about sexual immorality? Chapter 6, verse 1 does have a my son marker but does not have the additional encouragement to listen to the Father's words and obey His commands found in other speeches. 
We have already seen in previous speeches that a my son marker does not always mean the beginning of a new speech. Several actually appear as section heads within a speech. The four topics of chapter 6 verses 1 to 19 appear at first disruptive in nature. The topics include pledges of security verses 1 to 5, laziness chapter 6 verses 6 to 11, characteristics of a scoundrel verses 12 to 15, and the seven things the Lord hates verses 16 to 19. These topics are not connected with the surrounding material by words, phrases, or even theme. However, All four topics do describe wickedness that the Lord sees and punishes, as mentioned in chapter 5, verses 21 to 23. To me, chapter 6, verses 1 to 19 best fits as an extension of that thought in speech 5 rather than a totally unrelated beginning for speech 6. I am confident scholars will debate this for a long time to come. The way I divide it, speech 6, verses 20 to 35, returns to the theme of adultery. The first section, verses 20 to 24, introduces the parental teaching the son should follow in order to avoid the trouble of an immoral woman would bring. Section 2, verses 25 to 35, warns against lustful desires for an adulteress and the disaster that awaits the young man foolish enough to embrace her. The disasters the son would face are described as playing with fire, verses 27 to 29, theft, verses 30 to 31, a self-destructive character, verses 32 to 33, and the wrath of a jealous husband, verses 34 and 35. Let me add a few technical points. First, in chapter 6, verses 20 to 21, The father's call for his son to take the instructions and bind it on his heart and tie it around his neck seems parallel in purpose to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 to 9, the Shema. Listen to what it says. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Such similar parental instruction by the father to his son would immediately resonate with the importance to any young Jewish man. Second, the translation of verse 26 is uncertain. It could mean that the price of harlotry is a mere loaf of bread, whereas the adulteress wants your life, a bad exchange of unequal value. It may also mean that the harlot sees the young man only as a means to get her next meal. In this sense, Prostitution reduces a human being into a mere sexual object on both sides of the transaction, rather than emphasizing a person's humanity. Third, the fire of verse 27 is intended to symbolize sexual passion and may be the origin of the common proverb for us today, don't play with fire. The seventh and final speech of the father is found in chapter 7, verses 1 to 27. It warns the son of the already familiar sin of sexual immorality. The speech is divided into six sections, including an encouragement to earnestly seek wisdom, verses 1 to 5. The father's introduction of a story of a young man lacking wisdom, verses 6 to 9. The characteristics of the conniving prostitute, verses 10 to 13. Her planned meeting with the young man verses 14 to 20, the young man's yielding to temptation, verses 21 to 23, and the father's summary statement, verses 24 to 27. The whole speech resembles a parable or morality story. Let's look at a couple of technical points in the first five verses. First, the father's encouragement to keep his commands and guard his teaching parallel the introductions of speech 3, chapter 3, verse 1, and 4. Chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. The commands tied to the fingers and written on the heart, verse 3, reflect Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 to 9, and Jeremiah 31, verses 33. This emphasizes once again the internalization of the Father's teaching. Second, calling wisdom sister in verse 4 is an important Hebrew concept. 
sister does not necessarily mean a familial or blood relationship. Within the Hebrew language of love, sister and friend could indicate a special loving kinship. Sister occurs several times coupled with bride in Song of Songs, chapter 4, verse 9 to chapter 5, verse 1. There the groom says, You have stolen my heart, my sister, my bride. You have stolen my heart with one glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace. How delightful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much more pleasing is your love than wine, and the fragrance of your perfume more than any spice. By calling wisdom sister, the father is describing wisdom as a potential lover, a mate, or lifetime companion for his son. Have you ever tried to make a trap for birds? As a youth, I was fascinated by the thought of capturing birds. I made traps from cardboard boxes, wooden boxes, even wire mesh. Let me illustrate this. To entice a bird to come to my trap, I needed something that it wanted very much. Food. Placing the food inside the crate was not enough. I needed a way to allow the bird access to the food. So I placed a stick on the side of the crate to keep it open enough for a bird to enter. But I could not run up and pull the stick out by hand because the bird would see me and fly away. So I tied a long string to the stick and hid far enough away so that the bird felt safe enough to land, enter, and eat. This trap would only work if I put it in a place where birds visited and I had sufficient cover from the sharp eyes of the birds. In this sense, for my trap to work, I needed, first, an encounter. I needed a bird to see and come by my trap. Second, a place. I needed a place, a crate, to trap the bird. Third, the desire. I needed to create a desire, a plate of food, for the bird to enter the place that I built. Fourth, opportunity. I needed an opportunity like a stick and string by which the bird could get into the food. With these things in place, I was ready to go bird hunting. When the bird entered the crate, I could pull the string and catch my bird. In much the same way, the father is warning his son of the devious plans and hunting skills of the prostitute, with the son as the hunted prey. Let's pick up the story of the father in chapter 7, verse 6, and let me do a little preaching here. Verse 6. At the window of my house, I looked down through the lattice. I saw among the simple. I noticed among the young men, a youth who had no sense. The father is relaying experiential wisdom, something he has seen with his own eyes. Notice also that he calls the young man simple rather than fool. In Proverbs, a simple young man is one who is lacking wisdom or the ability to discern because he has not yet received instruction. A fool is someone who already knows the better way and decides to do evil. Here the father describes a young man who is unable to make good judgments. Verse 8. He was going down the street near her corner, walking along in the direction of her house at twilight, as the day was fading, as the dark of night set in. The setting of the story suggests the young man has no specific plan of evil. He is aimlessly wandering. He is not looking for a prostitute, though she is looking for him. He is in the wrong place at the wrong time, and he doesn't even know it. Verse 10. Then came out a woman to meet him, dressed like a prostitute. The father can identify the character of the woman by what she is wearing and what she is doing. This should be a huge warning signal to the young women of today. This woman is advertising her trade. She is looking for a customer. Or according to the father in Proverbs, she is seeking a victim. The father goes on to give seven descriptions of this prostitute in verses 10 to 13. Remember, seven would be a significant number for Hebrew writers. First, she comes with crafty intent. She has a plan that the young man is unaware of. Number two, she is unruly. Other translations say loud, a necessary characteristic if you are calling attention to yourself. Three, she is defiant, probably to her husband, also to the community well-being and to the laws of God. Fourth, her feet never stay at home. Now in the street, now in the squares, at every corner she lurks. This suggests a woman who doesn't take care of her home responsibilities. She has priorities mixed up. Fifth, 
She took hold of him. In a society where physical contact is limited, she is breaking social etiquette and crossing sexual barriers. Six, she kissed him. More than just a polite greeting, she is making bold sexual advance to the young man. And seven, with a brazen face. Though she addresses and acts wickedly, she does not express shame. She boldly sins to push for her prize. Such is the characteristic of the wicked. They are bold in their depravity. Now the prostitute lays her trap to capture the young man just like the bird in cage we illustrated earlier. In verse 14, she says to the young man, Today I fulfilled my vows and I have food from my fellowship offering at home. So I came out to meet you. I looked for you and have found you. The prostitute's mention of peace offering at first seems confusing. Either she is a foreigner who worships her deity with sexual encounters, or she is saying sexual encounters will not spoil her worship by making her unclean since she has already completed them. What is clear is that wicked people can speak and act religiously without truly being faithful to God. She is pretending to be a good girl. Second, the place. Verse 16, I have covered my bed with colored linens from Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. She is describing an alluring, sensual atmosphere intended to arouse the young man's sexual passion. Is she succeeding? Is he interested? Third, the desire. Verse 18, Come, let's drink deeply of love till morning. Let's enjoy ourselves with love. For a young man lacking sense, this news is too good to be true. Here is a beautiful woman apparently desiring him. This is very tempting indeed. He is hesitant. He is unsure what to think. He is not thinking of the danger. Fourth, the opportunity. Verse 19. My husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He took his purse filled with money and will not be home until full moon. What a stroke of luck. The young man thinks, not only has this chance encounter inflamed his sexual desires, but now his willing companion says there is an opportunity to fulfill them. Encounter, place, desire, and opportunity have all come together, creating an irresistible temptation, or trap, exactly as the prostitute has planned. Verse 21, with persuasive words, she led him astray. She seduced him with her smooth talk. All at once he followed her, like an ox going to the slaughter, like a deer stepping into a noose till an arrow pierces his liver, like a bird darting into a snare, little knowing it will cost him his life. The illustration of the bird caught in the snare is a perfect example of the young man's fate. He will not only lose his money, but he has chosen the foolish path that his father and proverb says ends in death. His death is described as a slaughter, his punishment is a consuming death. The father ends his speech with a moral of the story or a summary statement. Verse 24. Now then, my sons, listen to me. Pay attention to what I say. Do not let your heart turn to her ways or stray into her paths. Many are the victims she has brought down. Her slain are a mighty throng. Her house is a highway to the grave, leading down to the chambers of death. The father mentions the prostitute's house as a highway, a broad, easy way to the grave. The Hebrew word is literally sheol, which means place of the dead. This speech is even more relevant today with the threat of AIDS and the numerous sexually transmitted diseases, STDs, to which a young man or woman exposes themselves to if they engage in random, illicit sexual encounters with strangers. More importantly, such behavior, according to Proverbs, leads to a way of life that is wicked in God's eyes and leads to spiritual death. Dispensing wisdom through the literary technique of speeches given by an older, wiser father figure to young men is extremely clever. Experiential wisdom is framed within a family setting where love and concern for the son or student is obvious. Let me remind you that the setting of Proverbs suggests the kind of instructions given just before the young man leaves his own home 
and ventures out into the world. The speeches provide guidance to the young man on how to conduct himself for maximum success in life. We are to assume the role of the young man and listen to the advice of the father. But the father is not the only one dispensing wisdom teaching in chapters 1 to 9 of Proverbs. There is another voice calling out to the young man and to us. She wants to be heard as well. It is the voice of wisdom. In chapters 1 and 8, wisdom is personified as a female who calls out to the young man, hoping he will listen to her invitation and counsel. In the next lesson, we will examine her speeches and see what advice she has to offer. Thank you for studying these speeches with me. Let me end this lesson by saying, stay away from wicked companions. Until next time.